Hello everyone, happy October Awareness Month. This month we're trying to promote awareness for a variety of different things such as ADHD, autism, uh, learning disabilities, dyslexia, Down syndrome, and mental health issues. Today, I had the pleasure of Chantel joining me to speak again. We spoke to her on Monday talking about ADHD and women. And today we're gonna to be speaking about ableism and inclusion. These are topics that are both near and dear to both of us because we feel that we need to create a, a better setting for individuals with exceptionalities so that we feel more welcomed and more included in the environment. Now, if you haven't done so already, please make sure you take a moment to like the Garforth Education Facebook page so you can learn more about when these lives are happening. So welcome, Chantel. Thanks for joining me again. Thank you. Thank you for having me. No problem. Do you want to give people a little bit of background about who you are, just in case they didn't turn in on Monday? Um, yeah, I'm the secretary for on the board of directors for BC at Access. We are a group of volunteer run nonprofit society that helps support families of children with disabilities and complex learners, um, access and equitable education. Um, I'm also a mom of two uh, fantastic kids. And um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> I've done a bit in my past, so I'm not going to go through all that. <laughs> Yeah, they look at time too. Yeah. So today we're focusing on ableism and inclusion. And that is all about making sure that people understand the language that they are using mm -hmm. and how everyone can feel welcomed into a setting and have their needs supported. So Chantal, do you want to take a moment and just tell us what ableism is? Well, there's a really great description of ableism that I found, and I'll just find it once again here. Um, let's see, ableism is discrimination and social prejudice against people with disabilities or who are perceived to have disabilities. Ableism characterizes persons as defined by their disabilities and as inferior to the non-disabled. So these can be in my opinion, this is kind of how I think of it as, is, is passive ableism and active ableism, where you actively discriminate against somebody, you knowingly discriminate against somebody based on their um, disability. Um, most ableism is passive ableism because they don't know any better, they are doing it without even realizing they're being ableist. <clears throat> so, the conversation word really needs to start being used a lot more. Um, we finally started using the word racism a lot more um, and explaining those things for what they really are. Um, and, you know, there's been some pushback because I, I think a lot of people misunderstood really what racism was <clears throat> and how we can be passively racist. Um, and so now we are really starting to consciously uh, aware of what it means. Um, within ourselves and within our systems that we have. Ableism is the same. And, and that, that I'm starting to use a lot more in my vocabulary because I think people really need to understand um, that the things that they are doing, the actions they are taking, the words they are using are really ableist and are minimizing, discriminating, and um, gaslighting people's experiences um, in the global community. So um, like passive ableism would be, I mean, people can really understand this um, visually because this is a visual um, disability. So you can see that I have a disability. Glasses are the most, um, one of the oldest ones that we recognize, you know. And so ableism would mean that um, they would take my glasses off and say, well, you should just be able to read this. Um, I'd be like, no, I really need my glasses. I need to put them to actually see what it is that I need to read. Um, another form of, of ableism that people would instantly recognize is not having a ramp for a wheelchair. Um, so what we're trying to dig down into now uh, is it looks for like for invisible disabilities um, like um, ADHD, uh, stuff like that. And what I've been trying to do and trying to put out there is we have to first think about what ableism actually is. So we need to kind of reflect and see, okay, well, 
let's listen to some people with disabilities and what they think about ableism and, and how that works in their lives and stuff like that and start to really think about it. Um, and then there's the talking about it. There's talking about it with um, the people who are involved, directly involved. So if you're a policymaker or something like that, are you bringing the proper people to the table to talk about it, to find their experiences, um, things like that? And the next step is after that is doing it, to actually go and do those supports, um, to be, uh, effectively create those supports to for that person. Um, and we, I know we were talking about how, you know, uh, and to me, once you have remove the ableism you have now inclusion so to me ableism is is actually exclusion really and so you're not minimizing that person's experiences anymore you're not you're not ignoring their challenges um we're creating an environment where it helps that person um be successful in, in whatever way that looks for them yeah well and i think one thing that a lot of people well, you can't hear me Hmm. Are you on mute? <laughs> I don't think so. Hmm. There, can you hear me now? I can't hear you now. You can't. Am I going to do a monologue? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, here we go. So I used to do a radio show. It was all about inclusion called All In. <laughs> so here you go, folks. <laughs> um. Yeah, my radio show is on civil radio, and um, How about I, now? I, to, uh, I would have interviews with people talking about inclusion and what they do in their communities mm -hmm. for inclusion. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, hmm. Darn. Okay, she's put her headphones on and a mic. That's awesome. All right. It could be just me that doesn't hear you. Can you hear me now? No, I don't think so. I think it would be. Can you hear me now? Um, but yeah, so before our session here, uh, me and Catherine were talking about inclusion and how hello? Hello? sometimes the environment doesn't necessarily mean having that person. Uh, like say, for example, there's a child with uh, learning disabilities or whatever. Um, hello, hello. They have these needs that need to be met. Um, and sometimes the environment of the classroom changes hello, for the needs hello, of that hello. child. But sometimes there's there's something that just isn't going to fit hello? for that person. And so having a space, having a safe space, having a welcoming space um, that is right for this person um, can also be inclusion. And a lot of people think that once you get pulled out of the classroom, um, it would be segregation. But it if you do it right, it can be also inclusion. If you do it in the spirit of you talk to that person, you hello. think about what needs to be done and you actually do it. Hello, um, hello. So for example, oh, uh, yeah. a child needs to do learning um, in a, a certain environment because there's just too much noise. They're really not getting everything that they need. They go into a great classroom, uh, a different classroom that's smaller, that's quieter for a short period of time and uh, they get what they need and they have a good time with the people they're with because they're Hello? very similar, have a lot of the same- um, Chantel, can you hear me? Um, and things like that. And so Shelly Moore actually called it really well. A couple of years ago, she was in our conference for BC at Access and she called it congregation. Um, so for example, people who go to church, they're congregating. They all have a common um, interest. They all, uh, want to be there and um so that's very different than segregation and so if we can find those spaces for our exceptional learners um i think that will go a long way towards helping them with inclusion um but of course with always the the, the view of um oh she's messaging me great she can hear both, they can hear both of us, but I can't hear you, Catherine. <laughs> All right. So oh, this would be such a great time for me to be able to read lips. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so great. I mean, you know, can't they teach ASL or reading lips in school? 
wouldn't that be a great inclusive practice? I mean, seriously, that would be so awesome. And that's another way too of bringing in the challenges of our kids to the mainstream classroom. Everybody loves Nigel, our ASL interpreter for BC, um, for our health officer, uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry. Um, people love him and it's really taken off and people are starting to really think about it now and go, hey, you know what? Why aren't we learning ASL? Why aren't we learning this just as a language in school? I'm like, yeah, why aren't we? That is something we can do to help create an environment that's inclusive of everybody. And so we're not just singling people out and um, make it uh, kind of like, you know, you're over there, you're doing your thing. We can't help you because we just don't know how to help you. I hear that a lot. I find, um, and once we start thinking about things, once we start talking about things, those walls start to come down and a lot more understanding starts to happen. And um, I think it's really important. Well, and I think it's important that we stop trying to fit people like square pegs into round holes, right? Because <laughs> Chantal has no idea what I'm saying. But anyway, we, yeah. need to make sure, <laughs> we need to make sure that environments are suitable for everyone and not put the onus on the individual with the difference or the exceptionality to find the resources. So web hosts need to make sure, if you have a website, you need to make sure it's auditorily accessible so people who can't see it can understand what's being displayed on it. It means having options that don't involve people having to whip out their e-reader to access a menu or uh, you know, having students who have a, a reading disability or a visual disability, having to have them find a way to access the text uh, through Audible or something like that. And this is a really expensive endeavor for parents in getting the resources that they need in their child needs. It's a huge segregation issue. So we're separating the people that have the time, money, and ability to find out more to support their child or support themselves and an individual from those that don't have those same experiences and availability based on where they live, their finances, and what their personal situation is. Yeah. Oh, so can you hear me I now? Can, I can hear you now. You know oh. why? Because my volume was down. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's a tricky technology right there. <laughs> <laughs> figure it out sometime <laughs> yeah but it, I mean, these are these are things that we need to become more conscious of as a community mm -hmm. and realize that some of these accommodations that we put in place for individuals that need them are also going to help the general public for whatever reason I mean you know for people whose vision is starting to go down but they aren't ready to accept that they need glasses um, yes. I know people that have carried little magnifying cards in their wallets so they can read a menu. That's just right. Exactly. Glasses, right? Or if you forget yeah, why glasses. can't they just make the menu big? Like, <laughs> I'd love to have a big menu. I love it when they have big letters on it and it helps my kids with learning, you know, it just, it's, it's just so much better all around. And I, I really think that people need to start realizing this. So if we can start getting that word out there more, because people don't know what they don't know and um, they get a little fearful of change and stuff like that so you know if we can talk it out have those people come to the table and actually discuss things be curious ask questions what can we do you know and then believe them when they say that's what they need <laughs> and make it just a part of everyday yeah. life and then one thing yes. that as you mentioned Suzanne Perot was talking about was mm -hmm just because like, you shouldn't have to repeatedly have to ask for it over and over again if it's already yes. something that you've been given access to. Yeah. And, you know, the system needs to take responsibility. Yes. Um, you know, one thing um, is for people, you know, the handicap parking tags. Yep. Right? 
those have yeah. to re be renewed on a semi-annual basis and yeah. you know it's a hassle you have to go into physically to the office to get it done and restate physically going have. to the office isn't that funny eh yeah, yeah. just crazy yeah i mean here there's a word that's actually pretty ableist um is the word crazy using the word crazy for something it actually demeans people who um it really comes from folks who have had bipolar who have schizophrenia and stuff like that so those terms are really not very helpful to be using um unless you're speaking about you really the, those are very negative terms and we we do that in the knowing that you know, we're really talking about kid, people with schizophrenia, people we think we're crazy kind of thing, right? But we just don't understand. We don't, we don't understand those. We don't understand that that disorder as much as um, we'd like to as a general pop public. But um, yeah, I, we were talking about inclusion. Sorry, I'm going to go back here. ADHD, I tell you, it's great. Um, well, so the other thing is you brought up Shelley Moore. And I remember um, I've seen her speak at the BC Ed Access Conference, and mm -hmm. she was saying how she was working at this high school with um, the, you know, the um, pullout class mm -hmm. or the, the, the life skills class, mm -hmm. and they decided they wanted to be more inclusive, so everybody should go to the pep rallies, but then they realized, well, that's not good for everyone. So let's say that the doors open so they can go outside or they can wear their headphones, and then yeah. they realized that some of the you know, the students in the school also preferred that because yeah. it was too loud for them and yeah. too stimulating for them. And it's the same thing, like the, the quiet corners that you can create in classrooms mm -hmm. for, you know, originally they were designed for students who need to help regulate themselves and just to mm -hmm. reset and focus. Well, every That's single great. student in the class is going to benefit from that because there's going to be some time where they need that time. Exactly. Exactly. That's very mm -hmm. much, very much it. Yep. Um, yeah. And then once we have that in place, we're starting to become on the same level of language too, because language is also really important in what we're describing. And so when they start to realize, when they start to understand the language behind it and what that language means, like this is a safe, quiet space, kids are like, oh, oh, this isn't just for kids who are going crazy, you know, kind of thing, or meltdown or tantrum. They like to use the word tantrum, um, as if you know they can choose to turn it to turn it on or off, you know, kind of thing. Um, then I think we start to become on the same page. You know, we start to have that understanding, and we start to remove the ableism of that language and realize that, you know, we all benefit from from these things. Well, and also the the same thing is for you know for children with autism or individuals with autism mm -hmm. there's a lot of trying to retrain them to make them appear quote unquote normal yeah so if they are stimming or doing a repeated action that helps them feel better a, a lot of people are trying to get, remove those and mm -hmm. does it really matter if they flap their hands if they're excited like just as a you know an example right yeah. Yeah. It's not hurting you. It's not hurting them. If it helps them in that situation, why shouldn't they be able to do it? Exactly. Exactly. Right. Accepting the person for who they are. I mean, you know, we should be changing the environment, not the person. Yeah. And that's not to say that there, there aren't things that we can do to help support them in this situation. And if it's something that they want to work on improving or they find it, um, not very conducive for what they want then that's a different yeah. thing but yeah. it's, it's the same thing that we've seen with the way people dress yep right mm -hmm. we're, we're being more accepting of people choosing different clothes to wear you know some people are more comfortable in bright vibrant clothes while others mm -hmm. prefer like it, it does it really matter no if yeah this person you know wants to do a certain thing and yes it doesn't fit the mold of what you think should be done that doesn't mean it's not accepted exactly exactly we don't make everybody get their nails done and say that no one can, or you can't it's not all or nothing right yeah it's not exactly fake nails 
and it's okay if you have them and it's okay if you don't have them like it's that's right personal choice we can i i think society needs to learn to adapt a little bit more um like for example i had i had a situation where i was doing something i was having one of those you know at home parties but it was virtual right because um you can't have it at your home right so this person was very um they kept asking me a lot of questions and there's a lot of posting and it was very confusing like there was just so much going on and like she's I, and finally i just said to her i said look you know like I am really confused about what's happening here. I feel like you have way too much going on on this whole party thing. Can you just break it down a bit more, please? And make it more like bullet points. And then um, I said, I also have a really hard time calling people. That's something I just can't do. Um, and, and so I'm gonna tell you that for me and the people that I know, their lives are very chaotic. And um, at any point in time, they might not be able to participate in this, right? And we need to be aware of that, right? I felt like I was really kind of opening up and saying, you know, like, like this isn't, this format's not working for me. I find it very overwhelming and my friends are finding it overwhelming um, and we're losing customers basically is what I'm trying to say, right? Mm -hmm. Well, she didn't take it like that at all. She's like, no, it's fine. It's easy. Just read it. And she said, just, just contact more people, just contact as many people as you possibly can. I'm like, that's not how I operate. Okay. <laughs> like, and she totally dismissed everything I said and said, no, no, that's not a big deal. That's not a problem. And I, and, and it was a big problem. I didn't, a lot of people were just like, I don't even know what's going on anymore. I'm not following. I have no idea what's happening. And then she posted this like hour long video that we're all supposed to watch. <laughs> it's like, wow, no, this is not like working and I was really disappointed by that I was like it's such a simple thing to just do a couple of little tweaks I was actually asking her to do less work <laughs> and she was like no I want to do it all <laughs> okay the other thing that we need to get away from is having to identify someone yes and use it as like oh you know sorry the so-and-so person has autism or they're blind can you do this no, yes. I'm a person, I have needs. This is what I need to have my needs met. Yep, exactly, exactly. We and shouldn't have to use a label to justify what we need. Yeah, and I remember when I was in, when I was in university, it was really neat. Like this is a while ago. And um, the professor, we're using a whiteboard with different colored whiteboard markers. And he would write the first letter of the color he was using. Because back early in his career, he had someone that had color blindness. Oh, and yeah. so it's something that he started doing and got into the habit. Hmm. And, you know, I, I've known people that have things like red, green cover blindness that don't realize it until they're an adult. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you know, if something like that comes up, you just have to be like, oh, yeah, sure, easy. And on, like, I think it took maybe, an extra couple milliseconds when he was writing his notes on the board to just say what color he was doing it in. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, if you don't have to make a big deal about it, like I remember I was playing board games with a friend who had red green color blindness and he was saying, can we not use both of these colors when we're playing? Yeah. Yeah, I exactly. I was like, Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's not a big deal, but yeah. you know, once you know it, it's not something like if you know something like that about a person, you should try and make yeah. a conscious effort. Just like if you were having someone over for dinner and you knew mm -hmm. they were allergic to nuts, you wouldn't be totally nuts. So, so, so true. And we're, we're getting, we're getting way better at that nowadays. So yeah. that's just, it, it now needs to be a wider scope. It needs to now become policies. It now needs to become mandates. It now needs to like be embedded in our systems, in our systems language. So when we talk about districts and what they do, what kind of language do they have in their policies and where are they making sure that their policies are not ableist themselves? Well, and I think that's a very important thing. And um, especially with how expensive it is for assessments and that sort of thing. And some of the accommodations yeah. or modifications 
are really quite simple and easily to apply yeah. on a class-wide basis. For example, allowing a student to use a calculator in math, most mm -hmm. classrooms have class sets. The times where it's not appropriate to use a calculator is when you are assessing fluency. And that means yep. how fast you can complete the sums. And if a child has shown you that they know how to do this, but it's an area that is weakness and they haven't memorized their math times tables, then letting them when they're doing long division or something like that, where it's not testing that specific skill using a calculator is not hurting anyone. That's and you right. know what? The kids that know their time tables are going to find it takes too long to use a calculator, so they're not going to use it, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. exactly. And applying that as an accommodation and, you know, the ability to use a computer to write your answer, mm -hmm. right? We're not at the point where every classroom has enough keyboards for everyone, but, you know, yeah. allowing students to have their answers shown in different formats. I mean, if you're teaching about sentence composition and essay structure, that's fine. But just having note form, if the test is not assessing their ability to write a paragraph, then if they give you seven points that are the main facts and the questions were seven points and they give them to you, they should get full yeah. marks. Exactly. And you shouldn't be judging them on their grammar and punctuation and spelling because they know the information. And if you were assessing them in another way, they'd get full marks. That's right. So the assessments themselves can be um, passively ableist, right? I mean, we're, we're looking at uh, an education system too, if we really want to dive into the education system deep here. It's really old, but it's the same. It's been for so many years. It hasn't really adapted and changed. There are a lot of educators out there right now that are really trying to um, get the word out um, you know, I mean, they started with universal design, but again, <clears throat> we have to train up teachers. We have to train, um, everybody to really, um, start to embrace that whole idea. Right. Cause that was supposed to be a more inclusive system. Well, and even the teacher education system and once teachers are teaching is ableist, right. Is those who can yeah. afford to and have the resources to, and yeah. are in the location that can get mm -hmm. the additional training, but if they don't have the time and money mm -hmm. and aren't somewhere where that training is offered, how are they going to get it? Yeah, it's privi pretty privileged. Um, and then when we talk about special education itself, like I know some teachers that were going to go back to learn to get their degrees or their masters in special education, but it's only the people that can, um, that have the money, that have the time to do that. Um, to go back and, and learn that. And this is something though that I, I get really uh, heated about is the fact that we don't actually teach our teachers to teach kids with special needs and learning disabilities. And that's something I really kind of blows my mind and that people don't really fully understand. And um, I think it's a huge issue. They're not giving the, the tools to the teachers, right? And they're coming in and I've had teachers come out of school going, I, I had no idea, I, I, didn't, I didn't know anything. And so now there's a movement of, of younger teachers who have who've grown up through that and said, you know what, we really need to start helping our younger teachers or they're gonna start burning out and um, really start to help our kids with special education. And I've had a few go back to school to well, learn about it because they're like, <laughs> have the same under they don't even have an understanding of what the diagnosis means and how to get information yeah. from the psychoeducational assessments or the disabilities yeah. like I know that I've gone into meetings where you know and it's really disrespectful I find when teachers do this but I also know all the loads on their plate but if they don't have a clue what the diagnosis is I'm like can you actually explain that to us yeah and it's kind of like okay well I'm the parent you're the one that arranged this meeting yeah. It takes this long to Google it. I can tell you how it meets my child, but the basic mm -hmm. definition you should have when I'm going into this meeting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right? And parents, exactly. you know, I've, I've talked to many parents that have that, especially when their child has complex needs. So we need to talk to, you know, the ministries of education and department of education to have these resources available for the educators to access. Well, there, there kind of is, okay? And so, but the thing is, 
is a lot of districts now are starting to recognize this and they're starting to have pro D days that are around this, but pro D days are not mandated. Um, pro D days are not all, there's only like one pro D day I think that's mandated or whatever. So um, they can choose to look at that information or not. But what's happening is, is, is that that's just after the fact. I think what we need to look at is continuing education, right? And, and this goes for school trustees, this goes for superintendents, this goes for all school administrators, anybody that works with kids with disabilities needs to know about these disabilities. Like it just doesn't, I don't understand how um, it's possible to have a job where you work with a certain person, but don't know that, that understanding of that person. I just don't, I don't understand that. It's kind of like, say you were a medical office assistant, but you were never trained in medical office assistants. I'm, I don't, I don't understand. Like, how are you going to do the work if you don't know how to do that work? And I realize that there are a small portion of the population, about 12 to 15% um, that we know of, um, but that's still 10 to 15%. We have 64,000 kids with designations in the BC school, uh, school system right now. 64,000 children. That's a lot of people. Um, a lot of kids who are going through the system and the right now the grad rates are pretty low. Um, so something's got to give. We got to like start changing the dial on this and policy is where I like to, to you know, poke at um, policy for the ministry and policy through the districts themselves. And a few districts have done some really good work and you can tell. Um, you can tell like parents are like, I, I'm actually pretty good here. This is going good for my kid. Um, there's some really great success stories out there, lots of them. Um, and if we could just clone that <laughs> and put it throughout the system, right? Um, but again, it takes training, like you were saying, um, talking about it, you know, well, doing it. There are some common elements to several disabilities like you don't need to become an expert in all but I think you know all educators should have significant training in executive functioning support because yes, this is sure. something that several different exceptionalities are weak in it's something that every human is born with the innate ability to develop but they don't develop until children reach school age and putting a support in place for a child that's weak in this area and everyone in the classroom is gonna benefit everyone. And that's gonna help you with your executive function yeah. skills that can always get worked on, right? Exactly. And I think it'd be a lot less stress on the teachers. They, they just, you know, um, once you start to understand it and you start to get it, you're like, oh, okay, I see. That's why there's a problem there. And I, the teachers that have, have started to really understand it, they're like, they do these simple, things like breaking down the work, um, uh, highlighting what needs to be done, um, giving more time for certain students to do their work, stuff like that. Um, that's fairly, that doesn't cost any money. Let's put it that way. Um, and it requires only little effort. Um, we do need more EAs though. I, I will say that. <laughs> we need like a million more EAs. Um, I would love to see one in every single classroom, maybe even two, um, would be really amazing. Yeah. And that's also a support like glasses. So EAs are like glasses. The kid has their great EA who's very supportive. Then the teacher is able to teach. Um, it just it just makes sense, right? And then the, the classroom is, is peaceful. Everybody's learning and everybody's um, uh, getting what they need from the classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, we're on the right path, but we're just at the beginning of the trailhead, right? And I feel hopefully like, yeah. we can make some changes. And I know now during COVID it's difficult, but at the same time, we're seeing all these unique solutions to problems and mm -hmm. realizing that, you know, there are other ways that we can do things that are going to support, yes. you know, so hopefully there will be more distance learning options that come out of this for the students that really thrive in a distance learning environment. That's right. Whereas going to the school in the classroom is just not for them. The anxiety, the stress, the situation, you know, there, there's yeah. things that we can do to prevent it and still get them the education that they need.
Yeah, very much so. That's exactly it. And I think that's what, that people are starting to realize there's different ways of doing things. And we're just gonna have to be flexible about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you and so much for coming on with me. Uh, this thank is a you. great topic and I'm sure we can dive into more detail another time. It's lovely mm -hmm. to have you. And uh, okay. if you don't know about the BC Ed Access, it's definitely something that I suggest you look into regardless of whether you have someone in your family that has diverse needs and needs the support because you may know someone down the road that could benefit from this. That's right. We have a public page um, and we put a lot of our resources there as well. Um, we have a website bcedaccess.com, b-c-e-d-a-c-c-e-s-s.com, bcedaccess.com. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you and have a great night. Thank you. Bye.